After a tragic accident, Mary Frances Varela's daughter was in a coma for over two months. Doctors gave up. Today, her daughter functions normally, even though her brain scans show severe brain damage. The medical community, they can't explain it. Next on this edition of It's Supernatural. Centuries have come and gone, offering wisdom and understanding throughout the ages. Today, there should be nothing beyond one's power to discover. And yet the strange, unusual, and mysterious world of the supernatural defies understanding. Stay tuned for a unique and powerful investigation into a curious, undiscovered universe only on It's Supernatural. You know, the worst words that a mother can hear is that her daughter was in a tragic accident, but there's a little bit more to that. The night before, she woke up, not at a normal time, and started praying and was told why she was praying. Mary Frances, why were you praying earlier in that morning of that tragic day? Yeah, it was about four o'clock in the morning, and um, God woke me up and said, I want to talk to you about your children. And so I went downstairs to pray with him, and he said, ask me for my graces and my mercies for your children, which didn't make much sense. I'd never heard him say that before. And as far as I knew, the children were great, you know, out of school and doing what they wanted to do. And so everything seemed fine, but he knew something was coming. And so he said, ask me for my graces and my mercies. And it was about five hours later when we got a telephone call about Christina. What did it say? Well, they told us, or told me, my husband was already there. And they said, Mrs. Ferralo, you need to come to the hospital. Your daughter's been in a terrible accident. And your husband's nurse is coming to pick you up. And so I hung up the telephone. But when I did, I uh, believe... Uh, by the way, her husband is a dentist. Mm -hmm. That's why her husband's nurse. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> and uh, um, I believe when I hung up the phone that I heard the words, life and wholeness, Mary Frances, life and wholeness for Christina. And so I had that just tucked into me all the way to the hospital. And then when I got there, family was there, and, and um, Nick, my husband, proceeded to tell me or give me the litany of Christina's injuries. What was Christina like before the accident? Um, five foot two and blonde and eyes are blue and brilliant and an outstanding athlete, very popular girl, student leader, um, and full of God, you know. And what was wrong with her after this tragic accident? Uh, in coma, uh, uh, her brain had been sheared. You want me to tell you about how yes. it happened? She was on her way to work, and she came to a light and went through the light, but so did a milk truck. And the milk truck came through and rammed her in to a bridge abutment. And the big utility pole came down through the roof and uh, took her ear and broke her collarbone and her arm and her right hip. And then the car came in this way and broke all of her, or rather fractured all of her pelvis and uh, ruptured um, her spleen and then broke her ribs, tore the aorta to her heart mm. and then took her brain and sheared it. And, um, but it just so happened that two cars behind her, she was trying to get up onto the interstate, was a paramedic truck. That's a little bit of mercy. <laughs> and the paramedics made their way into the car. It was all crunched, but they made their way to give her an airway. So now, was... when you saw her for the first time, describe what you saw. Oh, my. That was uh, that evening, even after all the surgeries, open heart surgery being one of them, you Whoa. know, for the torn aorta. And, uh, and so when we were allowed to go in, my husband and our son Nicholas and I, we stood there and it's hard to believe that's your beautiful daughter. They've shaved part of her head and they have a, a brain monitor that can look like a thermometer you'd use on a turkey that goes down through your skull and into your brain to measure brain pressure. And then um, she was on totally full life support in uh, a little bed wrapping and a diaper. And there was mm. our wonderful 23-year-old. I mean, I mean, a girl that's got everything going for yes. her, and then mm. you see her. Uh, what was the prognosis by the doctors before the heart surgery? 
Um, they weren't sure that she could even make it through the heart surgery. They didn't give her much of a chance of survival for the surgery. And then they said that even if she did survive, that the chances were that she would be a paraplegic because they were going to have to cut off this blood supply um, from the waist down. And depending on how long it took them to make the repairs on the aorta would be the, the limit to the the paralysis. And what's going through your mind and what's going through your husband's yeah. mind when your daughter? Yeah. I mean, this happens to someone else. Yeah, it doesn't happen to you. Well, in the emergency room, after Nick had told me about all of her injuries, I told him what I believe God had said. And uh, we held on to that. We really did. We had nothing else. And, uh, and so we, we huddled together, the family that we are. Nick's family is huge. There's a lot of Italians were at the hospital and a lot of friends. And we stayed together, and there were those that prayed and those that comforted and, and believed that, indeed, there would be life and wholeness. But what happened? Well, we uh, come out of the, the surgeries and, and see our daughter, as I described to you, in the intensive care unit. And that does not look like life and wholeness to you. Her face was all twisted like that. And um, her hands had curled up already because of the brain shear. Well, what does a brain shear mean? Well, it's when um, the, the skull is a certain size to contain the brain. And because it was hit at such a force, then the, the brain goes back and forth inside the skull. And like a part of it can go and it shears it, it just almost like rips the brain. And that's what happened. Nothing came in on her, her head. Is it you know, just the force just of the going force, back? Yeah, the force for which she was hit was like, um, I think the truck was going 45 miles an hour. Christina had gotten up to about 20, but that combined into a concrete wall of the bridge, you know, uh, took the brain and ripped it. And it was full of blood and air. And they said they didn't even know where to begin to operate. The damage was so severe. The truth, were you getting angry with God? Angry? No. Honest and true, I wasn't okay. angry. Um, concerned. <laughs> you know, Very was, concerned. <laughs> but there did was you never just a good report. Did you just remind yourself those words you heard from God? Well, it certainly was something how he went about it. To wake you up at four in the morning, and say, ask me for my graces and my mercies. And then five hours later, your daughter's in a tragic accident, and you hang up from getting the call from the hospital, and God says again, Mary Frances, life and wholeness, life and wholeness for Christina. It's almost as if to say, it's not what you see. It's not what you see that counts. Remember what I said. You know, and that's it's what we did. It's not what you see that counts. But if you were in that situation, it was your daughter, it doesn't get better in the natural, it gets worse. We'll be right back after this word. Hello YouTube, Mishpocha. Mishpocha is a Hebrew word, it means family. This is Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. If you've been blessed by this show, please subscribe, then click the bell so you won't miss a single episode of It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. I'm here with Mary Frances Varello. And, oh, what a tragic phone call she got. Her daughter was in a collision with a milk truck and her aorta going to her heart was severed. She had to have open heart surgery, uh, broken bones. Her brain, though, I mean, that's very, very important. Her brain had uh, inside of it from, from the jolt, yeah. so to speak. Uh, what was inside of her brain? Uh, the MRI showed that the brain had been sheared. It's like taking something and ripping it. And then uh, it was full of blood and air, and they couldn't tell where the air was coming from. Okay, she's in a coma. Mm -hmm. What happens next? Well, um, every day was worse than the day before, it seemed like. Um, there was never a good report. All kinds of infections set in. and. Um, uh, it, 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 there was nothing to encourage us. But you, you know? did have that word from God. We had the word from God. 
and uh, but it got challenged daily. Mm. <laughs> and then um, after the as the two months carried on, um, I made a determination uh, at the beginning though that I wanted the hospital to see Christina healthy and whole because she was in the intensive care unit for so long that we took a picture of her riding horseback and had it blown up poster size and then hung it over the hospital bed in what, the, what the ICU. What was the reason? What was the motivation? So that, because the, the young lady that they were looking at was not the daughter that we intended to return to us. Hmm. It was the daughter there hanging on the wall on the horse. You know, that was the one that would come back to us. But that word, life and wholeness, it sure didn't look that way, no, but that's why you need the picture. <laughs> yeah, life and wholeness was looking a little thin, <laughs> but it was still there in our hearts. You know, when there just isn't anything else, you'll grab hold of something like that. And there wasn't anything else. The second day out, they came to us and they said that if she should survive, that the brain damage was so severe that we would need to put her in an institution and that we needed to be considering that. That's just two days out from the accident. That's how bad it was. But she kept living to everyone's surprise. And after about 14 days, they have to do a tracheotomy on you, you know, and um, to, in order for her to continue to breathe, uh, they did that. And then they have to do a feeding tube so that your body can continue to be nourished and, um, and remained in a diaper and in coma and that was as good as it was supposed to get. They said that even if she woke up, Sid, even if she woke up, that they said that, um, that she wouldn't know what planet she was on. She was marked That's PVS. Not a very <laughs> good report, but you made a very interesting cassette for her. Tell me yes. about it. Uh, healing scriptures. You know, I uh, went through the Bible and there's different uh, scriptures that pertain, pertain to healing. And so um, I had done that, uh, oh, a few months be before the accident. Um, and then I had that available just to put on Christina. And so that remained on her because our spirit, they say, you know, your spirit is always awake. And, but your body rests. But, but it still had to be hard looking at your daughter like that. It was terrible. <laughs> it really was when you're used to someone being so active and, and so brilliant, and there she lay. So how long was she in a coma? A little over two months. Uh, we were two months in acute care, and then we had to move her. Uh, they said that we had to uh, find a nursing home for her, and my husband and I uh, didn't agree with that. Uh, we, we wanted more for her than nursing care. We wanted a rehab center that would receive her. And did, what did the doctors think about a rehab center? Oh, they absolutely did not agree. In did other words, not they had agree. written her off. Oh, yeah. well, essentially, she was marked PBS, which is persistent or permanent vegetative state. And Ooh. so it was a, a nursing home you know, is all that they would agree to, which uh, left us in a little bit of straits, you know, uh, with insurance companies and, and other physicians. And so we were kind of on our own in what we were gonna have to do. So we traveled to Washington, D.C. That, that, that just sounds mm -hmm. awful. Permanent vegetative state. How would you like that report on your daughter? Mm -hmm. Permanent vegetative state. But you decided you were going to take her to a little better than a, just a place to vegetate. Yes, right. Uh -huh. we, we investigated, uh, there were three uh, rehab centers in the United States that would receive her, and we went to them. Uh, my family stayed with her in, in Nashville, and then we chose Houston. Uh, a Dr. Bonke was there that was wonderful, and we chose Houston, Texas, and TIER, the Institution for Rehabilitation and Research. But you got a little more than you bargained for when you decided to fly your daughter yes, there. What happened? we did. <laughs> well, we had to get our own plane because uh, the hospital was not in agreement with us, and and uh, and Nick really wanted to uh, get her there as fast as we could because there were such problems still with her heart and, and, and with her breathing that we knew we couldn't belabor her body in a long flight. And so um, my husband Nick got a Learjet and out of Atlanta and a medical crew and they came to Nashville 
and up into the room to get Christina. And she was in fever at that time. And um, no one was in agreement with this move. And um, there was one uh, trauma surgeon, Dr. Ed Rutherford, that said, well, give her a chance. She's so young. And that was about it. And uh, so we had to get on a freight elevator. And uh, all of us packed into the freight elevator. No physicians, no nurses, just the, the flight crew, you know, the medical crew. And down we went and into a corridor to get our ambulance. And then. <laughs> we, we get to the door to go outside into the parking lot to the ambulance and people are running toward us because the engine of the ambulance was on fire. Hold that thought. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's bad, but mm -hmm. now they're taking their daughter out against the doctors. Well, they want her to be a permanent vegetal, vegetable and the ambulance has a fire. We'll be right back after this word. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. And I mean, it's gone from bad to worse with their daughter. I mean, permanent vegetative state. And then they're against the doctor's wishes. They're, they're taking to a place where maybe, I mean, she's still in a coma. Maybe something good will happen. The doctors say, no, nah, there's no chance. One doctor said, give her a chance. And they're on their way, taking their daughter to the ambulance, to the jet. And the ambulance catches on fire. Let's go to the control room because I want to talk to my producer, Janie Duvall. Janie, our guest next week is Rick Amato. And I am so excited about the discoveries that he's going to tell everyone. Tell me a little bit about it. He'll be talking about the 10 lost tribes. In the Bible, it talks about the 10 lost Israeli Jewish tribes, that they would be found before the final war, before Armageddon, of, of the close of the end of this age. And he has met rabbis who know where these 10 lost tribes are. You know, it's an amazing thing that God preserved the Jewish people for these thousands of years. But what is so amazing is the ancient rabbis read the Jewish prophecies, and they found out that these tribes would be preserved as tribes and returned to Israel. And no one thought that was possible with the intermarriage and everything else. But he's found them, and the stories that he has, I mean, it sounds like the Raiders of the Lost, lost Ark. What I find amazing is that these people, there'll be maybe just 5,000 of them in India or, or Afghanistan or the other parts of um, the world that they've found them, and they'll have Jewish symbols or we they'll be wearing prayer shawls or they'll be um, having animal sacrifices just like in the Old Testament. It's just so amazing that this Bible prophecy has come to pass. Well, you're not going to want to miss next week's It's Supernatural. But Mary Frances, the ambulance is on fire. <laughs> what do you do? Well, well, uh, we were going to wait right there in the corridor till we were told. But then suddenly, the portable oxygen tank that was hooked up to Christina's tracheotomy began to make noises, squeaky noises. And they looked at the gauge, and it was just about out of air, which shouldn't have been. So one paramedic says to the other, where's the other tank? And they said, in the burning you know, in the burning ambulance. And so oh, um, so now they uh, know that they're out of oxygen and, and Christine is starting to make a noise and in other words, in need of air. And they said, where's the emergency room? Well, we didn't know because we came down on a freight elevator and nobody was with us and we didn't know. And suddenly there was only, first, there was only one door out back into the hospital and one door from the outside to, to where we were standing. And suddenly there was this man standing there and we all looked at him and he says, this is what you need to do. Go through that door. And he told us the directions to get to the emergency room. So we took off running with her and looked back and he wasn't there anymore. But how did he even know what you were supposed to do? We don't know. You think it was an angel? I think so. 
Okay. Who else could it have been? What happened next? <laughs> and then we did as he had told us to do. We get into the emergency room. Well, here we all are. We have no authority to be there. Uh, we have checked out, in other words. And, and then the team, the medical flight team, they're calling out. They're saying, we need suction. We need oxygen for the patient. And they're saying, who are you? You can't be in here. And everyone started jumping and doing like this. And then suddenly, this woman, who appeared to be a nurse, stops everyone, looks at me, and she says, I know know you, follow me. And I didn't know her, but I didn't tell her. And I followed her into an, uh, another room where there was everything that we had need of. And they took care of Christina. And then we were told that it would be, oh, an hour or so before there'd be another ambulance. But then suddenly there was a knock on the door. And they said, your ambulance is here. And so we went on that ambulance out to the airport where the jet was waiting. And you, you would think that at least you could get her to this other hospital okay, <laughs> but you're not even able to land. What happened? Yeah, I, we get up over Houston, and uh, Christina starts having difficulties in her breathing and with her heart. And so um, the nurse asks the pilot, how much longer are we up going to be here? Because we were in a holding pattern because there was commercial traffic ahead of us because we weren't marked as a medical flight and just a private flight. And uh, he said, we're here about 20 more minutes. And so the team said, she hasn't got 20 minutes. We need to get down. And so he talked to the people in the tower and we heard the conversations and, um, and they and the different uh, commercial aircraft that agreed to bank out, which is a cost. In, in time and money, but they agreed and they called our letters back, you know, Lear, whatever our number was at that time, Lear. And then um, and uh, one captain, we could hear him say, you know, uh, God bless you. Another one would say, good luck, you know. And then we just dropped down through the funnel into Houston Hobby. And they're waiting for us. With Someone's looking over. Yeah. You, you get to the hospital. Mm -hmm. But Christina's still in her coma. Yeah. The first time she recognized you, tell me about that. Oh, it was a wonderful day. Suddenly, um, Christina's face on twisted. Her eyes were no longer yoked. So were that, you watching this with oh, your eyes? Yes, yes, yes. I was there when God did it. I was there, and and she, uh, her face began to untwist because it was all you know. Contorted. And then her eyes were no longer yoked, and they came jumped into position, and she began to look around, and she couldn't talk because of the trait. But she said, Mom, Mom, where am I? What happened? And then... Uh, How long had she been in the coma? Uh, I think it's about 51 days, oh, like two and a half, two and a half months. And, and the doctor said she was going to be a vegetable. Oh, yes. And she, but she, it was like she was asleep and came out of it. Today, tell me what your daughter is like. No, oh, she's wonderful. We had a family picture. I don't know if y'all got it or not, but uh, she's beautiful and she's out and about. She runs in races, doesn't win them uh, like once she did, but she's uh, um, the, the windshield had popped out instead of in, so no facial damage. She works in public relations for a big company in Nashville. What does the brain scans show today? <laughs> well, the brain scans just about the same, except no blood and air in there. In other words, should she be functioning from a medical viewpoint? Oh, no. Uh -uh. That's why she's on a little computer chip in a medical computer in Denver, Colorado, where there are no uh, known statistics uh, concerning medical cases like hers. What's the reason that she's normal today? She's God. better than normal. <laughs> she's better than normal. Yeah, her dad says she woke up smarter in all the <laughs> testing, and she was already an outstanding student. And she is. She's smarter than she was then. And there can only be one reason. God said life and wholeness. God did it. <laughs> and I say to you, in the name of Jesus, life and wholeness. Yes. Life, there's only one life. It's the life of God. When Mary Varello played God's word over and over again, on the cassette, life, the life of God, went into her daughter. The life of God is Jesus. Do you need life? Then repent of your sins, tell God you're sorry, and ask God to forgive you because of the blood of Jesus. He paid the price for your sins. And ask life and wholeness 
to come into you. Life and wholeness. Jesus, come inside of me. Say that. Jesus, come inside of me. Thank you for your life. Thank you for your wholeness. He is. He's coming inside of you. And a back has just been healed in Jesus' name. Thank you for your life. Thank you for your wholeness. Thank you, Jesus.